Welcome back to the webinar series Sustainable Biosolutions 2020. Today is the second day and the third session of this webinar series, so, which is jointly organized by Biomol.in and the Department of Biotechnology, Rangara Veltech Rangarajan Dr. Shaguntala R&D Institute of Science and Technology. So the main objective of this series is to expose you all to, to the different aspects of biotechnology. Okay, so let me begin with a short introduction about who we are. So Biomol.in, uh, which was started in 2016, is India's first and one of the world's leading online portal where you can buy all kinds of laboratory life science and diagnostic products. We have one lakh plus products from 150 plus brands right from chemicals, microbiology, chromatography, genomics, proteomics, equipment, consumables, and a lot more. We also have a dedicated page for corona essentials like mask, eye thermometer, any protective equipment, sanitizer, disinfectant, all the reagents and kits that are used in the laboratory for diagnostics and research. You can find everything online on biomol.in. So now I may request Ms. Nandini uh, the faculty from Veltech University to please uh, proceed with the session. Thank you, Dr. Viraj, and welcome to all. We are the Department of Biotechnology, Veltech, Rangarajan, Dr. Shakuntala, R&D Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai. I'm happy to bring this webinar in association with Biomol.in. Veltech Chennai was established in the year 1997 by Dr. R. Rangarajan and Dr. Shaguntala Rangarajan. This institution is a private deemed to be university and is ranked number five in the country by MHRD for innovation and has a diamond rating from IGOG, 43rd among Asian universities in the Times Higher Education World Ranking. Our Department of Biotechnology aims to create and promote upskilled graduates with a professional attitude who are industry ready. Now, I'm very happy to introduce a speaker, Dr. V.R. Manoj. Dr. V.R. Manoj. Head of the Department of Biotechnology, Veltech, Rangarajan, Dr. Shaguntala, R&D Institute of Science and Technology. Dr. V.R. Manoj earned his PhD from Anna University, India, for his work on environmental biotechnology in the year 20, I mean 2010. He worked in the bioenergy industry as an R&D senior executive officer for over a year before entering to the academics in 2012. He has over 17 peer-reviewed publications, 15 national and international presentations, 52 online video lectures, and over 50 scientific articles, three books, and granted one patent. He has authored over 100 articles on bioethics and related issues. And Dr. V. R. Manoj is a founding member of the Indian chapter of humanity, formerly the World Trash Humanist Association, the Publicity Secretary for all, for the All India Bioethics Association, and he is a life member of the All India Microbiologist Association. Today he is going to share about the major interesting topic about the environmental ethics current perspectives, and all over all over the India is much interesting to learn about this topic. Sir, please can you start? And uh, today's talk will be very, very interactive. So I would like you to, you know, really wake up and become active in the chat box. And in between the presentation, I will be asking you some questions. And I would like you to, you know, uh, put your answers in the uh, chat box and try to answer the questions. And basically, this is, a, this is a, at the outset, it appears as a philosophical subject, environmental ethics. But now, with the advances in uh, science and the advances in genetics, uh, philosophy is no longer possible, actually. Yesterday, my, my professor, uh, Professor Vasudevan, sir, had a session here. 
and after the session uh, we had a discussion where he was telling me that uh, today there is no environmental ethics there is absolutely no ethics uh, here and it is not possible also in this day and age to talk about ethical consequences of any given technology however um, i have been an old horse in this particular ethics uh, business and uh, ever since uh, dr azaria introduced me to bioethics in 1997 i have been very active in this area and uh, i feel and i believe that uh, we must have some kind of boundary walls or some guidelines or some kind of regulatory network in order to pursue our research activities whatever it may be however advanced the technology may be or however grand the consequences of the technology may be so it is very very important that we study the consequences because basically you see even in our own dna or in our structure there is a lot of uh, regulation which is happening so you see you, you do some genetic engineering you will have to go inside the dna and going inside the dna getting to the dna is not that easy you will have to go past the cell you will have to go past the nucleosome you have to go past the nuclear membrane you have to go past the nucleus you have to go past the histones you have to unfold the histones the first the chromosome has to be unfolded you have to go past the histones you have to go inside then inside there are the sequences and there are so many things blocking you so many enzymes blocking you only then you can reach the dna sequence itself and uh, even the dna itself in its natural course of time when it is either transcribing or translating there are a number of regulatory mechanisms in the form of rna which uh, stop the uh, unwanted regulation or the unwanted expression of certain genes and uh, there is a very good reason why certain genes are not expressed otherwise if certain genes are expressed then we will probably be end up with the tails and horns so we have all the genetic sequences and uh, there is a very important reason that regulation is there and that is a starting lesson to why the regulation should be there in whatever we try to do as well and the biggest impact of our technology or our genetic science or anything in that nature is towards the environment so today i would like to begin the presentation with a basic outline of environmental ethics so that all of you who are attending this lecture will have a basic idea of environmental ethics then i would like to put inside your head some questions so that you really start thinking and uh, i would really appreciate if you can start typing in the uh, chat box when i request you to so that you know i can have some varied views on the ideas so this is uh, this is this will start out as a philosophical discussion but uh, more than the philosophy there is a lot of science behind it and there is a lot of technology behind it and we should try to you know ascertain how to do it now uh, let me start the first slide right so these are some basic uh, information about uh, environment definition of what environment if you want to de define the environment the environment is defined as the sum total of the biotic and the abiotic components biotic component means living system abiotic components means non living systems so non living and living if you bring it together then it is called as ecosystem so ecosystem is the interaction of the biotic and the abiotic uh, components now we know environment we know ecosystem now what is pollution within the environment if there is any undesirable change either because of physical chemical or biological components then that particular change undesirable change is called as environmental pollution now this is a very very important question undesirable to whom undesirable to the environment or undesirable to you for example if there is a lot of uh, industrial wastewater poured into the river and there is a lot of bad smell coming out then if you are able to mask that smell by adding a chemical then it is no longer undesirable to you is it or if the color is undesirable then you can add a decolorizing agent and the pollution will still go in it will still have the bod and the cod but uh, there is no visible pollution there is no undesirable change for us but there will be a consequence to the environment so should we bother about the consequence to the environment or should we bother about the consequence to us so this is a very very important question and uh, this particular thing in the end i have written in the slide you can see so this pollution uh, should it be unethical is pollution unethical or is it undesirable or is it avoidable or is it inevitable so pollution in any industrial process is inevitable actually you cannot avoid pollution you cannot avoid from doing pollution you cannot say i will have a, a perfect industrial process which absolutely releases zero pollution no it is not possible as far as current technology is concerned 
But, so once it is inevitable, is it avoidable? Of course not. It is not avoidable. It is treatable, fine. It is reusable, fine. It is recyclable, fine. But is it undesirable? Undesirable is a relative term. Undesirable to whom and at what degree? So is it undesirable for human species or is it undesirable to plant species or is it undesirable to microorganisms? So different levels, for example, a heavy metal may be, uh, I mean, may be desirable to a human being for levels of up to maybe 10 ppm. But uh, that same concentration will be extremely toxic to a microorganism or to aquatic plant. These are relative terms and it is very important to us up to where we draw the guidelines. So most of the guidelines that we have in the CPCB, the Central Pollution Control Board or the Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board or even uh, the ones uh, subjected by the international guidelines, most of these pollution guidelines are relative to humans. So human diseases, human tolerance limits. So most of these are related to humans and very few of these guidelines are relative to animals or to aquatic life. So aquatic life is extremely sensitive and uh, that is why we always speak about uh, biochemical oxygen demand and chemical oxygen demand. In yesterday's brilliant lecture by Professor Vasudevan and the previous lecture by Mr. Sri Devakaran sir, you might have seen how important it is to you know actually try to manage some of these waste, some of these biodegradable waste and try to control the biochemical oxygen demand and the chemical oxygen demand so that the aquatic life and ourselves are not damaged. So let me come to the relative term. So let me go to the next slide now. So slowly you start thinking about whatever I'm speaking because now right now it is a philosophical talk. So here you can see that always in environmental ethics there are two viewpoints. So if you want to love nature, there are two ways in which you can love nature. You can either put yourself in the center of everything and say, I am the most important person in the world. And around me only all the animals are, all the plants are, all the microorganisms are present. It is for my pleasure and it is for my utilitarian uh, reasons that such a thing is existing. So such a thing of putting the human ego in the front and all the animals and creations in the surrounding and the environment in the surrounding, that kind of viewpoint is called as the anthropocentric viewpoint. So anthropo is something which always anthropology, like that anthropo is something which we used to describe the human being. So this is keeping us as the primary importance, prima facie for the environmental protection. So every protection that we do, we do it because it is mattering to us. The other viewpoint is to have a holistic viewpoint that is considering ourselves as an integral part of the environment and all the components of the environment as the part and parcel of us and we are not so important we are only a part of the environment so therefore whatever we do has a direct consequence and whatever the environment does also has a direct consequence to us so this is like a holistic view and this is called as ecocentric view now i would like to start changing your mindset across these two views now at the outset this anthropocentric view looks very bad. Okay, it looks like it is full of ego. But the ecocentric view looks very, very nice. It looks very pleasing to the eye. It looks uh, as if you can accept that uh, viewpoint. Everything is fine. But slowly, I will try to try to tell you what kind of uh, information you can glean or what kind of mindset you will have when you think of certain aspects. Right. So you can see the uh, slide here. I hope the slide has changed for everybody now. So another viewpoint of viewing the same thing. The previous one was just defining it as uh, uh, anthropocentric or ecocentric. Now you can see in this slide, I have drawn a funneling, uh, funneling kind of structure. So you go from the bottom to the top. If you go from the bottom to the top, you will see uh, at the bottom, you have the egocentric view. One individual, me, 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 always telling, I am important, I am the best, I am the superior. Then slowly you start thinking of other people. So whatever I should do will have consequences for others also. So I should be more responsible. So I do things for other human beings. So then you do things which are responsible towards other human beings. You make an industrial process or you treat the wastewater so that other human beings are not harmed. Then that will go ahead and it will move across to the living animals, the plants, the aquatic life, the various forms of life. So now I am more concerned about the living organisms, the biotic components. So then this is called as biocentric. So 
further if you go further you are going for the uh, concept of you know vasudeva kudumbam where you think of the entire planet so the entire planet i should be careful i should not harm the tree. i mean i should not harm the mountains i should not harm the stones so i should be more responsible when i am mining for mineral resources i should be more careful when i am harvesting the oceans for their oil or hydrocarbons so i should be more careful when i am doing fracking for hydrocarbons so these are the viewpoints which slowly funnel out from the egocentric all the way through anthropocentric biocentric and then to the ecocentric so in this viewpoint if you see you will uh, you will try to observe that the ecocentric viewpoint is the best viewpoint but here my argument will be that uh, it might be so at the outset because we are all very moralistically superior we always think that we are very very moralistic beings and we care about everybody but deep inside we don't want to die so if you think about the corona virus the corona virus is a living or organism or a non living organism it is not clear it is a it is a virus so virus is either non living or living but uh, we are trying our best to eradicate it from the face of this earth so i will also be showing you a different kind of viewpoint on vaccination here so that you know your mindset is slowly changed and uh, you will try to understand uh, some other kind of viewpoints now so if video is not clear then please refresh your browser then it will come i would request uh, uh, either biomall or uh, our own uh, uh, browser to you know please help the audience in the chat box uh, now uh you see this is kind of a very very spiritual slide uh, beyond anthropocentrism so i don't know how clear the slide is for you perhaps we will send the slides again to you so this uh, in this uh, here you can see that uh, from the left to the right uh, if you move then you can see that from the human being just as in the funnel that i showed you from the left to the right uh, you will see that uh, human beings going out thinking of other human beings and being sensitive to their ability to suffer and going out to all the living beings and then going out to the entire planet so when you think of every every single uh, cell or every single stone or every single rock or every single drop of water then that is the highest level of thinking that you can expand to so expanding your environmental consciousness that is another way of putting it so having consciousness for your own actions having consciousness for your own consequences of your own actions to the individual person see for example if you keep your house dirty and uh, you don't clean your house for uh, say 2 or 3 days especially during the lockdown period if you don't mop the floors of your house after 5 or 6 days you will find it difficult to live inside the house then you will start cleaning the house to improve your condition after 10 days if you have kept the garbage outside your house you will see that the smell is going to spread to other houses and they are going to start complaining so in order to not disturb your neighbors you are going to put it in the dustbin the central dustbin you are going to take it and put it so that your entire neighborhood is not dirty and slowly this environmental consciousness extends to the entire uh, place and uh, then you start uh, trying to you know put the waste or treat the environment in such a way that it does not harm the other living forms then apart from the living forms you will find that the living forms and the non living forms are in some way related to each other so you cannot keep growing away at a mountain and uh, removing everything from there then the living organisms will not be able to survive you will have landslides the plants will not be able to grow so all these things will come then you start protecting them so slowly the expansion of the environmental consciousness is what i am trying to explain to you here i hope it is very clear for you so far now we will go into the next slide so as i told you in this presentation i am not going to let you sit back and enjoy okay so basically i am a teacher and uh, the teacher's uh, genetic nature is to make the uh, audience or whoever is listening to the teacher to always respond so this is something which is built into us it is a sort of inherent genetic quality and i apologize for that and uh, i request you you to please actively use the chat box and uh, uh, try to respond so in this picture you can see left to right you can see two families two different kinds of families so in the left side you can see a family in the cave ages living in harmony with nature and uh, wearing the clothes which are uh, you know obtained from nature sustainable living and uh, you can see that he is not carrying a gun he is carrying a club 
so that they are very happy and in the right side also you can see an equally happy family they have a good haircut they are living in the city and they are living in a very clean environment so which do you think uh, is more environmentally ethical so which kind of lifestyle is more ethical to the environment can you please type in the chat box so as you type in the chat box i will continue with my le lecture okay first one uh, first one if we consider ecocentric point of view okay most of you feel first one and ancient time good very good both are okay we have one person who says both views are good and uh, one person who says definitely first so most of you are saying the first uh, viewpoint is the more uh, elegant one which is more environmentally ethical which is what uh, i would also say at the first stage but slowly we will try to compare some other uh, scenarios also okay thank you thank you very good very good super very good audience now we will go into the yes but right now we are in the anthropocentric view yes we are in the anthropocentric view and uh, we uh, would like to see even in this point of view if you see that is only for anthropocentric he is working for his family and in the right side also he is uh, working for his family so first one because population is lower so environment is able to sustain okay very good very good okay we will go to the next slide now good thank you so much now you tell me in this picture which is more environmentally ethical uh, having a lion free to roam in the forest in the jungle in free to have its environment or keeping the lion inside the tv screen <laughs> it is a completely unrelated picture but i thought you know it will get your brain cells uh, rolling so that you are able to you know actually ascertain the practical aspects of environmental ethics so which do you think uh, is more uh, better to have the lion out in the jungle or to have the lion in the television screen so most of you are saying that first 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 one and some are saying both so let us see the consequences of each now you see when we take a decision like this when we take an environmentally conscious decision when we think that we are taking a decision for the environment we are taking a decision for the betterment of the environment we often tend to forget ourselves so that is the most important message that i want to say but i think it is too early to say this message in my lecture i would say i will tell you to move to the next slide i will go so here you can see the environmental consequences of our action see in the left side i showed you a lion freely moving in the jungle so let us assume so this is my assumption it may be wrong from your point of view but you see uh, i have an interesting view point here uh, from one miss devyani both even in the second picture the lion is free in the jungle <laughs> good good this i did not expect so very good very good very good yes it is it is a it is a very remarkable uh, view point and uh, now you can see that uh, which is more environmentally ethical here so in the left side if you allow the lion free in the jungle then you should also face the consequences that the lion is a wild animal and it is going to prey it is going to hunt and kill and it is not going to be a pretty sight eh? it is not going to uh, go and cook the meat in the kitchen and uh, give it uh, pleasantly in a decorated curry leaf structure in the plate it is not going to do that it is a very messy business and it is killing and eating in the nature so this will happen and this is the consequence if you allow wild animals free in the nature where you are living so here this is the consequence in the right side if you see if you confine it into the tv screen or into the zoo or into the you tame the lion and you control its behavior and you do it then what will happen the fundamental nature of the lion itself is uh, damaged the fundamental uh, that right side picture na no, actually it is the photograph taken uh, from the metro goldwyn mayer mgm movies in tom and jerry cartoon and all if you see there is a lion which will roar in the beginning of the cartoon so this lion they took the shooting like this only so you see the lion is a perfectly healthy male lion but see how calmly it is standing in front of both its potential prey in one second it can wipe out both the men but it is tame it has lost its fundamental nature its fundamental nature is to kill those people but it has lost its fundamental nature so is it ethical to do this is it ethical to control the environment to such an extent that the fundamental nature of the environmental components are completely changed or is it more ethical to have the environment in its original state in its original wild untamed state so this is a very very important question so in so let me look at some of the audience reply its captivity the basic instinct will be gone very good very good i think our uh, picture one balancing ecosystem and but this is important ecosystem balance for killing uh, and killing is required to balance the natural ecosystem very good it is important to maintain ecological balance fantastic 
so uh, for the echo i request uh, some connectivity issue will resolve it uh, okay madam is saying some connectivity issue uh, it is ethical to maintain the ecological balance it is not ethical to alter the cycle of nature it is it is a bit ethical to alter the cycle of nature but can throw the balance okay humans do it for earning purpose yes correct correct earning purpose okay we should be in our place let them be in our place okay very good okay here this is a very interesting question i will argue against this we should be in their place okay then uh, population is increasing human population is increasing and we need more place to stay so we need to clear more jungles we need to uh, we need to build more houses then uh, we should not disturb the animals so we should uh, grow vertically instead of horizontally uh, perhaps that may be a uh, a solution and the, uh, finding the solution for such things living in harmony with nature all of these things are very very important questions and they have a lot of consequences our decisions have a lot of consequences so now let me go to the next slide i will show you So, uh, we can think of managing the environment in several ways, but the environment is doing it in a beautiful way. The environment's consciousness, its system, if you look at it as a system, then the series of biogeochemical cycles that are present in the environment, the nitrogen cycle, the oxygen cycle, so I call it SNAPS, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. So, all of these cycles, they go ahead in perfect harmony and there is a perfect interaction between the living, the biotic and the abiotic components of the environment in a perfect cyclic manner so that everything is recycled. So, whether you are a Hindu, Muslim or Christian, ultimately, whatever you are, whatever is your consciousness or whatever you are built in, that will go back to the environment and the environment will assimilate all of that and reconstitute it into something else. So, all of this concept of birth, rebirth, all of these concepts, if you look at it from the environmental point of view, it is very, very beautiful because everything will get recycled within the planet and uh, perhaps there is some cycling going on between the planet and the universe as well, we don't know that. But as far as our knowledge of planetary biology and cycles are concerned, we do understand that every single component is recycled within the environment and our activities may or may not have a significant impact on this. Now, now we are at a stage where we think that our activities are extremely significant in the environment and we should do something about it. And the, one of the most significant activities which we have forgotten in this coronavirus incident is the climate change. So right now we find very few people discussing about climate change, but it is very much there. It is very much alive. The issue is very much a hot issue and uh, we should be very, very cautious about it. Otherwise, the management procedure of the environment will proceed towards environmental mismanagement so these are the systems by which the planet will actually lose control and whether we actually mismanage the planet or not these kinds of natural disasters and natural occurrences they are happening throughout the period of time i mean they happened in ancient time and they are happening now but the frequency has changed that is what is happening so uh, so far what have we covered we have covered what is environment, what is ecosystem, what is the difference between environment and ecosystem, why it is so important, why we call some things ethical, what are the different forms of environmental ethics, anthropocentric viewpoint, ecocentric viewpoint. Now, uh, I say you are, you are also telling a lot of things in the chat box that this is important, that is important. We will say that that is good, this is good. So basically what we are doing, we are putting a value there, we are putting a dot. So what kind of value are we giving to each and every system that we see so when you think of value systems especially in terms of the environment there are different kinds of values so from the point of view of the environmental ethics there are two value points that you can give one is the intrinsic value and one is the instrumental value the intrinsic value is the value of things that ends in themselves, regardless of whether they are also useful as a means to other end. That means me, I am having an intrinsic value. This Manoj is having an intrinsic value in myself. 
So that is intrinsic value. A plant or an animal is supposed to have its own intrinsic value. Whether you accept it or not, it is having an intrinsic value because it is present in the planet, it is there. So it has an intrinsic value. A stone has an intrinsic value to be in that place at that particular time. So this is intrinsic value. Instrumental value. Instrumental value means whether it is of use to you in any way. So most of the components that you see around the environment all will have an intrinsic value, but it is up to you. Or in your study of the environment, you find that it is of use to some other organism, then you call it as instrumental value. Okay. So instrumental value is completely relative. Now, which value system you will put more importance when you are deciding an environmental consequence? Say, for example, you are removing a large section of a forest. Then how you will decide which uh, value system you will follow? Whether you will follow the intrinsic value system or the instrumental value system. So now all of you are familiar with model sets, right? From school you are all learning model sets. So I would like you to type in the uh, chat box. Some of the participants have already typed that. So which do you think is an intrinsic value is better or instrumental value is better? What do you think? Instrumental value or uh, uh, intrinsic value, which is better? Uh, Ima madam has told intrinsic. Dave sir has told, I don't understand. Please reteach. Okay, I will reteach. I am just asking uh, whether uh, intrinsic value system or instrumental value system, which is more morally correct. That is what I want. So, Bhavana madam has told, uh, intrinsic value as instrumental value derives from intrinsic value. Oh, okay. Uh, sir, I feel there are different viewpoints. Instrumental value can be a viewpoint from outside of that organism. Okay, good. And uh, for considering ecocentric point of view, we have to consider intrinsic value. It is the value due to the existence. Okay, good, very good, very good, very good. So uh, we 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 have to that, that this this particular viewpoint is what is going on right now. Uh, that uh, whenever we try to do any metagenomics. Uh, in biotechnology, whenever we try to ascertain the quality of any environment, right now we are living in the time of data analytics. So a lot of data is collected about different value systems in the environment. We, Whenever we study any genome, we go through the entire sequence of the genome and we try to identify which genes are expressed in what frequency and what is the reason why the gene frequency is not uh is in a particular nature in certain organisms what is the reason in certain populations why is the gene expression in a certain fashion so these are the different items but when we study this we realize that certain characteristic traits or alleles have certain values so whether they have an intrinsic value or whether they have an instrumental value this decision making is very very important so if for example shall we remove all the genes which don't have any intrinsic value or shall we remove all the genes which uh, don't have any instrumental value but if we remove all the genes which don't have any instrumental value uh, then uh, we will probably be removing all the genes which maybe in the future may have some instrumental value right now we don't know but in the future sometimes it may be entirely possible that they may have some instrumental value so just to get your mind rolling against these two things i am telling this it's an example of you know uh, from a paper uh, which says a protecting nature for humans say uh, instrumental value of a nature so here we can find the environment's uh, concept so some natural scenery is there you see some movie the hero and heroine will be dancing in front of a lake so the lake uh, all the movies you will see that lake only so that lake will have an intrinsic value and you will say that that lake has an intrinsic value it is beautiful in itself but it has an instrumental value for you because it is useful for taking movie shooting sir so this is kind of difference between intrinsic value and instrumental value so which value you place more importance when you want to put an uh, industrial project there if you want to set up an industry in that particular site then uh, whether you will place importance or uh, take the decision based on the intrinsic value of that particular player the instrumental value of that particular place so this is a very very uh, important question so this is an example of how it is so earlier in the previous slide when you saw you might have seen how i how we funnel out so how we increase our environmental consciousness so when we are increasing our environmental consciousness we also try to judge the environmental consciousness so whatever we see in our scope of environmental consciousness we judge so it is like a very spiritual thing somebody is sitting uh, in a place and meditating and slowly the consciousness will expand 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 and uh, when it expands you either watch the things which are coming in front of you you try to judge them or you don't judge them 
the best way for enlightened beings is not to judge them but if you try to judge them how are you judging them whether you are judging them based on the intrinsic value or whether you are judging them based on the instrumental value now if you look at biotechnology or biosciences you will realize that whatever is inside you is also present in the environment and whatever is present in the environment is also present inside you nitrogen phosphorus sulfur oxygen everything which is there inside you is also there in the environment so whatever is there in me is in that outside place so that is why we have a very famous uh, holy man saying this me that me every me so we have a lot of me's coming up and uh, this kind of you know egocentric view or anthropocentric view or ecocentric view or biocentric view all of these new points they become important when we are trying to expand our human species now i am going to ask a very disturbing ethical question to all the audience corona virus whether it has a intrinsic value or whether it has a instrumental value please type in the chat box intrinsic okay you feel it is intrinsic well it has intrinsic correct so according to what i have been teaching you so far it is having an intrinsic value some of you are telling instrumental value okay for those who are telling instrumental value i would request you to type in why you are telling it is instrumental value intrinsic value we are able to understand but those who are yes as we have to heat so it is our us it could have been intrinsic but it is man generated so it is instrumental so here um, human generated things are not necessarily instrumental uh, human generated things can be uh, consequential or unconsequential here so it may be intentional or non intentional it uh, it may not even have any particular use for the human being it may have use for the plant or the animal that is why it is being constructed so sometimes it is there but we are not yet sure whether uh, yeah, echo sounds okay intrinsic so most of the audience they feel that it is uh, intrinsic value okay now the corona virus if you look at the corona virus a part of nature as a part of the environment then yes it has an intrinsic value but whether that intrinsic value matters to you whether it is ethical or not that is the question here so if i ask you the very un unnecessary question here uh, shall i protect the corona virus because it is a part of the nature obviously there is no logic in still preserving a few strains of the smallpox uh, uh, virus or any other deadly virus in a war in cryogenic conditions because we need the genetic information because some point of time it may matter to us so whatever we come across we need to gather data and we need to have a clear understanding of this because tomorrow if some virus comes from jupiter then we should know what to do about it so corona in that sense of the matter has an intrinsic value when we do research on corona it has an intrinsic value which will translate into instrumental value when we are making any uh, equipments or any instruments uh, from which will deal with corona then it comes to uh, instrumental value and here we have a view point uh, question comes down to who deserves to live longer humans or the virus very good question so generally you see viruses will live longer than human beings because uh, we are uh, we have a definite life span this amalgamation of cells that we call as a human being will have a limited life span after that the cells will disintegrate into the environment but the viruses they are able to survive and they are able to multiply continuously but if you take it in the concept of a life span a life span of a virus is much much smaller but the virus never really dies it multiplies human beings also never really die they multiply so survival of the fittest nature will select okay very good very good now i will go to the next slide right so now i will ask the same question different style okay now you see uh, bacteria of age i am i am pretty sure that most of the audience here are uh, biotechnologists or are related to biotechnology or are interested in biosciences in some way or the other now now the bacteriophage you see it is a virus just like corona virus the bacteriophage is also a, a viral particle but we use the bacteriophage to do the genetic engineering work so we are using it especially in the crispr system we use the bacteriophage to actively edit the genes the crispr cas9 system which is the hottest topic nowadays so we use it to actively edit any bacterial cell or any human cell or any stem cell so this uh, particular bacteriophage intrinsic or instrumental now you please tell me bacteriophage is it instrumental or intrinsic 
instrumental okay now people are saying instrumental so ramesh sir is telling instrumental komal madam is saying instrumental ankita madam saying instrumental ekta madam instrumental devinia madam instrumental monarch dev instrumental niveda instrumental okay most of the people are saying instrumental except dr baljit intrinsic so now it is the job of the intrinsic people to tell why they chose intrinsic value so at the outset yes in natural conditions also it kills bacteria okay now the sound problem is there no okay now i can speak it is so i am going to speak like a robot okay so this is a uh, i i i okay it is very difficult to speak like this but i will do my best for my, the comfort of the audience uh, it is dead before it has a host then it has no intrinsic value is that how this works if it is dead before it has a host then it has no intrinsic value uh, no if it is even if it is dead before it, it the intrinsic value is the value to itself to itself so if we are, this is a philosophical standpoint madam so we have to consider that everything we give a value system it is like a, it is from a, here we are slowly transcending from philosophy to science so when we are giving values in science, in science we usually don't consider morality but in case we have to consider morality we have to refer philosophy so in philosophy they say that certain things have a value unto themselves so there the scientist will try to define from the philosopher how do i put a value into a living being so if it is a living or even if it is dead that particular thing has an intrinsic value so a dead plant or any value can still extract bioactive components from them so then it has an intrinsic value it had an intrinsic value too. now it is instrumental value to you so i hope you have been able to understand so this bacteria phage is mostly instrumental value now we will go into the okay madam you have understood good yes when we talk about morality and philosophy how to justify and balance genetic engineering we are coming to that so i am going to leave you in this lecture with a lot of questions in your mind so that you have to make your own decisions on this aspect because it is extremely difficult because you see in 90s ian willnet he started the cloning with the dolly the sheep and uh, in vitro fertilization and all of these things were very very fancy things then and there was a lot of ethical debate in that time also and uh, during genetic engineering during the time of genetically modified organisms there was a sir please repeat the same point uh, danish sir in one minute i will repeat sir um, so this is a, this is going to be a problem and i will explain i have prepared a couple of slides where i tried to tell about the genetic uh, i mean the consequences of genetic engineering and how we can take ethical decisions so speaking about uh, the intrinsic and the instrumental value again even if a thing is dead it is having an intrinsic value and when you are trying to start using some things from it then it has an instrumental value for you now this is a picture which is shown recently in new york times and you see in 1955 this picture was shown in the front page of the new york times it was about the discovery of the salk polio vaccine so today every time even i am waiting for the next news that suddenly in some part of the world somebody has discovered a vaccine for the coronavirus and the human trials Uh, are almost over and they are going to go into production phase so we are all anticipating such a similar news so maybe one day we will get a news like this and you see city schools begin shots april 25 they have written like this we also want a time when we may have a vaccine and we are all eagerly waiting for the vaccine 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 no problem with audio i am repeating the word again and again so uh, what about the medicine nobody is bothered about the medicine now we are we are we are talking very little about finding a drug for the uh, for the virus we are we go on talking about the vaccine only whenever we talk about this virus we are going on talking about the vaccine 
so how safe is the vaccine what is the environmental consequence of a vaccine so here in my talk i would like to show you uh, the consequence of a vaccination okay so you must also think in your mind what does this vaccination mean to us so let us go into the next slide okay dr mohan says i think we can have question and answer at later i think yes yes but i, I feel certain slides i wanted you to you know immediately react to it that is why i have requested uh, the audience to you know interact in the chat box so that everybody is awake as i told you it is an inherent genetic nature in me to always interact with the people so who is safe from the virus whether the virus is safe or whether you are safe so this is a very famous poster by the mill and uh, melinda gates foundation along with unicef if you look uh, for any vaccination you will find uh, that this kind of posters are kept so this poster at the outset it means that the person who has taken the vaccination is protected from a world of very evil viruses and very evil pathogens and microorganisms but in reality if you look at it from the environmental perspective what you are doing is you are actually allowing the virus to propagate beautifully and you alone are protected so the virus is outside and you are inside safe this is one point another view point is you make the natural host of the virus protected so that eventually the virus will run out of the natural host because all the natural hosts are now vaccinated and then the virus may become extinct so this is there are two active hopes because of vaccination but uh, in general we find that always there is chicken pox always there is jaundice always there is encephalitis always there is brain fever always there is rabies and uh, most of these diseases have vaccines ebola has a vaccine now and uh, but the virus is still there so the environment has not got rid of the virus the virus has found some other host to survive in so this is a question that we must carefully consider that whether the environment should be protected from us or whether we should protect ourselves from the environment if we should protect ourselves from the environment then what does it mean does it mean that the environment is actually evil or does it mean that we are not worthy of being in the environment because our species is not strong enough to survive in the environment these are very very challenging questions which are going to be asked in the future to come so earlier one audience asked what are the ethical issues in genetic engineering should we reengineer our genetic nature so that we are resilient to these viruses and for any pathogens or any disease conditions that come against us yes i feel we should reengineer ourselves eventually otherwise our species may not survive but this is my view point some other person may take view saying that the human species does not deserve to be there it needs to transcend yes so dev sir has told sir but it is clear that viruses are disturb viruses are living thing or not it is impact is not much in environment what do you think i think i have just told you what i think its impact on the environment means it is having an impact it was having an impact in the animal world but you don't find the animal world coming on bbc and complaining about uh, different animals falling sick and falling down from the trees and dying we don't usually get complaints from animals we don't get messages in our whatsapp from animals or from plants we only get messages from fellow human beings so until we have a intelligent artificial network system or an internet of things system where uh, we are able to actively communicate with our fellow dogs and cats uh, it is uh, really impossible to find out whether the virus is harming the environment or not what is uh, for example if i ask a tree what is your opinion on this particular virus which is affecting you which is causing a leaf blight disease if i ask the plant how will the plant answer right now there are no diagnostic tools right now i have imaging tools or i can take the leaf and put crush it and put it in the hpc and try to find out compounds which are uh, representative of a particular disease condition then i am communicating with that plant so these things are very very uh, interesting things and interesting challenges that we will have. so we do not exactly know what is the suffering of a uh, fellow living thing or a fellow non living thing we can but we we are slowly becoming sensitive to the state of the environment that is very important thing that we should consider so what about the people who are already infected by coronavirus the vaccine will not treat them however uh, 
till the vaccine be able to prevent reactivation of the virus in the human body as it has been observed in many patients worldwide perhaps we don't know uh, so you can see the picture here you can see that if you love the environment too much if you love the environment too much then this is probably what will happen to you okay you will put yourself inside the cage and you will allow the environment to run freely so in the previous slide i showed you the example of vaccination here you can see that if you love the environment too much i love nature so much that i don't want to disturb it at all then nature is going to do be very very free if we all do the lockdown and we sit inside the house then yesterday in my house uh, so so the very little movement is there so a very big rat has come and it has disturbed all the plants so the animals will come inside if you do not mark your presence in the environment so everybody has a territory even animals have a territorial behavior so humans also the human species also must have a territorial impact on the environment so that the species integrity is not lost the territorial integrity is very very important to the human being whether it is usa or whether it is india or whether it is canada environmental territorial integrity is an important uh, uh, aspect yes uh, the line written uh, behind the picture is too much environmental ethics i changed the layout of the slide so some of the words disappeared i am sorry for that but that is what i have written too much environmental ethics then question mark so that is what i am telling so environmental protection conservation preservation so please understand there are clear differences between environmental protection environmental conservation and environmental preservation so how what do you protect what do you conserve what are you preserving this is very very important in the face of ethics so whenever you make a decision to protect or to conserve or to preserve what are you doing so how will you make a decision so far i have told you intrinsic value extrinsic value instrumental value uh, anthropocentric view point ecocentric view point so what do you protect or conserve will you do it for those with intrinsic value will you do it for those with instrumental value and if you if you decide that who will make that decision who will make that decision whether a biologist will make because biologist only knows the interactions a geneticist will make because he only knows the genetic sequences and the mendelian laws the laws of heredity how the propagation will happen whether a philosopher will make philosopher is sitting in the room and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, they, they, they may not understand the scientific consequences or the scientific advantages of this but they they have a very clear understanding of what a human being is what a value system is so can we allow a philosopher to decide or shall we even allow a politician to decide so how do we at the last i have done should an environmentalist decide so who will make the decision biologist geneticist philosopher politician environmentalist so who is going to make the decision whose res- whose decision do we respect as a society and follow because whatever decision we respect we respect as a country or as a society and we follow that particular decision so the polluter pays principle which is followed in most industries which is imposed on most industries by governments so do they follow it and the uh, genetic rules regulation rules regulatory rules which are laid down by the national biodiversity authority do we uh, follow it in our genetic research do we have a association for recombinant dna technologies should we follow them how why should we follow their rules how did they decide it who decides which organism to manipulate and which organism not to manipulate so these are very very important questions and the quality of the decision is extremely important so uh, here dave sir has replied environmentalist so environmentalist seems to be the obvious choice but the environmentalist uh, view points will be holistic ecocentric view points and uh, in the next slides i will show you some other view points deep ecology and ecofeminism uh, which are which are the stand points taken by environmentalists but a geneticist or a biologist will take a completely different view point so the quality of decision should we have a rubrics for this should we measure should we actually try to the system so how you will measure them when you are going to manipulate the gene using a restriction enzyme we have a decision that this particular restriction enzyme should not be used because it will cut off uh, 20 base pairs instead of 10 base pairs what about the rights of the uh, 10 base pairs which are uh, cut unnecessarily 
do we give a value system to the gene sequences or do we give the value sequences value system to the organism which represents that gene sequence so these are very serious ethical questions rubrics means madam uh, uh, marking system like if you write a class test unit test so one uh, one mark question you write 10 one mark questions then two five mark questions then how teacher will put mark for you in one mark question if you write four points then 0.5 marks for each so then you will get one mark so that you can easily trace if some other teacher is telling seeing that mark then you can easily trace that yes this is the marking scheme which was followed to reach at that particular evaluation uh, you know evaluation decision that that is the meaning of rubrics so uh, in this slide you have uh, you have like uh, measurable indicators leading to environmental ethics limits to growth study so this was done in 1972 using a supercomputer they did a computer modeling by mit research team they were funded and uh, they actually had some interesting conclusions and uh, their conclusions mostly ended up in 2020 which is why i am showing this slide now and uh, i think in 2016 or 2017 they have been advised to you know even start considering that uh, climate change uh, it was not properly represented in the model and it should be represented but this is one of the measurement characteristics this is one of the way in which we have tried to measure environmental ethics and uh, you see global industrial output per capita reaches a peak around 2008 followed by a rapid decline so these things they were able to predict by considering the mineral deposits or the mineral fluxes uh, fluxes means how they change over time so mineral fluxes and mineral deposits which were for industrial purposes at that time and projecting that exponentially across the decades so that maybe in 2045 what will happen will we have enough iron reserve will we have enough bismuth reserve to manufacture certain goods so this is why the the the, the findings of these studies like this is probably why now material scientists are looking for better and better composite materials and newer and newer bio materials so these decisions which are we take in the environmental ethics have very interesting uh, consequences in material science research also so these are some uh, pictures which are shown in magazines uh, of our environmental consequences see so air pollution land pollution water pollution so these are all different uh, different uh, things the consequences huge environmental impact that we have had so they have come on the cover of time india today science magazine so this is the anthropocene so anthropocene means the impact by human beings see impact of population population increase primary earth is increased ocean acidity acidification increased surface temperature increased carbon dioxide levels increased so this is the impact that we have on it as such so our impact anthropology anthro 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 and so we call it as the anthropocene so what is new about this this is desertification desertification occurs when the rate of rainfall is lower than the rate of evaporation so or when the rate of evaporation is higher than the rate of rainfall so causes are overgrazing and deforestation so this is like a, i mean this picture clearly shows you the impact of desertification and what can be done about it so they have planted some energy crops there jetrofa plantation you can see in the tar desert so desertification can be actually restored but it will take a very long time so in situ bio remediation is a technology which can be used to restore many environments but it is it it will take a long time and perhaps in the future we may have some technologies which will do it at a much faster rate but the consequences to the environment and the immediate consequences to climate are very becoming more and more evident now which means we should act more responsibly so till this point in my lecture i have maintained a very very neutral view point on environmental ethics i have not told you i have not even told you that you should preserve the environment i have not, i don't think at any point in my lecture 
I have told you that it is important to embrace the environment or to protect the environment. But we as a collective species must make an important collective decision to see whether the consequences of our scientific outcomes, see whether we make a vaccine, whether we make a drug, whether we make a treatment system, to whom does it have the value? That is very, very important. So environmental ethics, once more, uh, I have written in both English and in Hindi so that uh, our uh, uh, friends from across India and from across the world, they will be able to easily relate to this. So environmental ethics studies the moral relationship between, so a little bit of theory, now I am going to pump into you. So human beings and environment and also the value and moral status of the environment and its And it's non-human content. So anthropocentric viewpoint, ecocentric viewpoint. I hope you are all clear on this. Now we go into the next slide. According to this, it is it is a holistic viewpoint. You are, you are, it is a very, very it is called deep because it is a holistic viewpoint. So in that funnel I showed you in the beginning, the top area that is deep ecology. So it is a theory which uh, which argues uh, which which is having a lot of feeling, which is having a lot of emotion for the environment at large, for the planet itself. And this is very, very dangerous way of protecting the environment. Ecofeminism. Ecofeminism is a very, very important theory in environmental ethics because the subjugation of the environment is compared with the subjugation of women. And uh, there are lots of interesting arguments in this. And I thought I should expose all of the audience to this particular viewpoint also. So environmental ethics, anthropocentric, ecocentric, biocentric, then the anthropocene, then deep ecology, ecofeminism. So these are all very big concepts eh, which are uh, slowly getting bottled down. Uh, yes. Now, I have three questions for you. Uh, if you ask any, any environmental ethics person, uh, they will say that their fundamental principles can be concluded in major points. The earth and its creatures moral status, in other words, are worthy of our ethical concern. Okay, it sounds very, very nice. But I want to ask you, shall we give legal status to all of the earth's creatures? Shall we give legal status to microorganisms? Shall we give legal status to DNA? Is it okay to own engineered DNA? Is it okay to own synthetic life forms? Many of these questions already have answers in the legal system. So already there are lots of intellectual property rights on synthetic microorganisms. Already there are lots of intellectual property rights on DNA sequences. Already there are lots of legal rights on microorganisms. Already there are lots of legal status given to whole areas of environment, say reserve forest, conserved areas, endangered animals, red data book. So should we give them such a legal status or not? This is an important question. Second question. Yes. Ms. Urja has told it is very controversial. We cannot own nature just as we cannot own other human beings. Very, very important viewpoint. But here we are only dealing with the human beings. So how do we prevent another, another human being from damaging the environment? If we want to prevent another human being from damaging the environment, then probably it becomes, I'm just saying probably, I'm shrugging my shoulders like this. So probably it means that we must give it so that we can be able to better defend the environment. So in order to defend the environment, we may need environmental laws. So now I hope you are able to realize the importance of environmental regulation or environmental policy or environmental law. Because they are fundamentally based on environmental ethics. They are fundamentally based on our philosophical standpoint. So that philosophy is based on our moralistic standpoint. So whether all of these things are correct or not. That is the ethical question. That is the challenge in defining ethics or in evolving ethical systems. Because you see, you cannot stop the utilization of the environment. You cannot stop the progress of technology, but you can regulate. I still feel that we can regulate. 
So the earth and its creatures have intrinsic value, meaning they have moral value. So the challenge question is, should we recognize every single planetary entity, stone, rock, sand, as having intrinsic value? If we don't even know that it exists, then why should we value it? Should we even bother? So, third question. Drawing from the idea of an ecosystem, human beings should consider holes. So, challenge question. How is this assumption related to genomics? It sounds very spiritual. How scientific it is? This is the question I want to ask the audience. See, ecosystem, the human beings are saying biocentric deep ecology views we are saying. Exactly. There is a lot of grey. Dr. Shanti has told that there is a lot of grey. And uh, we cannot think alike. But we need systems because if we need to act as a society or as a, as a world, we need to have systems to which we all agree. That is why there are lots of conditions and there are lots of international treaties. Uh, there is the TRIPS agreement. Huh? So all of these treaties, they are continuously coming to collective decisions. So collective decisions are taken how? That is very, very important. For example, I can ask, how relevant is the Kyoto Protocol on climate change in this particular day and scenario? So, here, what are the limitations to environmental ethics? So many things we have discussed in this lecture for the past 1 hour 17 minutes we have been discussing. But you see, environmental ethics dealt so far only deal with the natural environment. For your environmental things which are there inside your house, for the built environment, there usually are no environmental ethics or environmental ethics is not being discussed. So sustainable buildings, do they sound environmentally more ethical than normal buildings? Natural pharmaceuticals, are they more environmentally ethical? Since pharmaceutical wastewater is a huge deterrent, pharmaceutical wastewater is extremely dangerous and they can even manipulate our gene structure. So is it okay? So that natural pharmaceuticals are more environmentally ethical? Workplaces and urban landscapes, should they accommodate nature? How? So should we keep a rule that we should have plants and trees inside cities? So urban infrastructure, how much should we accommodate nature? So how much nature we allow into our world and how much of our world should it be involved in nature? This decision should we take or should we not take? So these are the limitations in current environmental ethics which are being worked out. Slowly, the theories are being worked out. This is an ongoing science, just as genetic engineering or field is concerned, environmental biotechnology, any of these are being developed day by day. Like that, the field of ethics is also being developed day by day as the rules and technologies keep on changing. Now, genetically modified organisms. So, I mean, uh, the most of the audience here are from biosciences and they will know that it is not as simple as injecting a syringe into the tomato and changing its genetic structure. It is much more difficult than that and it is a it is a change which is happening in the fundamental nature of the genes itself but this is the this is the populist view how the general public would like to view the genetic modified organism without understanding what it really is so they may they may not know the difference between a hybrid organism and a genetically modified organism so i will go to the next slide workplaces would not accommodate nature but Nature has to accommodate workplaces. Very interesting question. Very interesting viewpoint. Uh, workplaces would not, nature has to accommodate workplace. But, uh, but if you ask, if you go and sit inside the forest, uh, um, then uh, you put a bench and a table there, then the lion is coming uh, in that area. Uh, it will not allow you to sit peacefully. If it is hungry, it will come and eat you. So that is nature. And you have to put a glass wall. So there you have to decide what you have to do. How much of environment you should allow inside. How much of you have to be allowed in outside? So how much of your activity? So when I say glass wall, how much of you have to be visible to the environment? Right at the beginning of the presentation, I told whether uh, any uh, water that you pour into the environment, uh, if you mask the smell, 
then um, it is okay to release it into the environment. It is not okay because it is still having high biochemical oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand. Uh, so it is still extremely dangerous. So now I will try to sum up some of the major issues in uh, environmental ethics and uh, see biopiracy very very important so natural national biodiversity authority i'm sorry i put agency so biopiracy is a very very important uh, aspect where natural resources or indigenous knowledge from our country may, may be stolen and this is unethical gmo spreading the, the random spreading of genetic modified organisms especially plants so if they are unfertilized then it is okay but if they are fertilizable then they can mix with the natural population and natural indigenous varieties may become mutated and they may be lost from the genetic pool then there is the controversial issue of GMO exploitation of farmers by corporates. This is warrants to an entire separate lecture. So GMO exploitation of farmers and uh, GMO dependence. Traditional varieties may become redundant or disappear. So these are all long term consequences which we should be aware of in environmental ethics. So now uh, you see. The, just as I was telling you, in 2017 itself, they have started selling genetically modified fish. Okay, so salmon fish, it takes a much shorter time to grow, it weighs more, it costs less to produce. Earlier, salmon used to be grown in sea cages, now it can be produced in situ, and this is started to sell and it is reaping a very big profit. So, people are eating it, it is mixing with their bodies. Whatever you eat will mix in your body, the nitrogen and the phosphorus, whatever is there in that will go into your body. No consequence since 2017, at least we have not been hearing it on the news. So it should be safe, it may not be safe. It may be safe for you, but it may not be safe for the environment. So which is more ethical? Is it safer to have things which are okay for the environment or is it safer to have things which are safer for you? So these are the viewpoints or the standpoints that we should take when we look at environmental ethics as a holistic viewpoint. So you see, it is no longer philosophy. Philosophy is gone from the equation at all. It is completely measurable now. And we should take care and we should start quantitatively assessing our ethical standpoint. That is very, very important. So six more slides. And then we will come to the question and session. So this I want to show you, this is the traditional way of, uh, this is one of the biggest problems, bigger than Corona. We are all obsessed with Corona, Corona, Corona. That word has become very stylish now. Uh, but uh, yes, I understand it is dangerous, but you see malaria is much more dangerous. And in certain parts of Africa, it is deadly. So uh, we genetic, genetic engineers, biotechnologists, we have been trying to control this malaria for a very long time by meddling with this genetic nature. And the technology available so far does not allow us to impact the entire population because if you release such a recombinant uh, mosquito into the population, you can see the division here. Uh, the mosquito with the modified gene will eventually, the genes will not get actually transferred and it will eventually dwindle away because we are not in total control of its genome. But now, since maybe uh, 2018 or 2016, uh, we have a technology called uh, CRISPR, so CRISPR Cas9 systems gene drive technology. So please look it up in the internet. We have such technologies which are coming up and they are widely used to influence entire populations in the environment. Look at the impact. I'll show you the next slide now. You please look at the impact. Can you see? You can influence the entire population, not most in the single population concept in the end, lost bottom, you see, all the mosquito are recombinant now. They will no longer multiply. Yes, yes, Google mosquito project. Yes, this was by Bill Gates and Melinda Gates. And this is one of the most active things which are going on. In Singapore, are doing this very actively. And this is one of the latest strategies which is followed. But again, you see, um, earlier I told this uh, kind of viewpoint is uh, your sound is on and off. Okay. Now it is better. So I was I was I was I was trying to speak one word at a time, but again and again I lose control. So 
it is important that i speak one word at a time yes okay uh, so now we will uh, go for the crispr uh, uh, link you can see that uh, uh, you, the almost all the mosquitoes are able to successfully manipulate the entire population of a particular species you can wipe out the species you can wipe out very with a surgical precision surgical strike with surgical precision you can genetically alter the population and you can wipe out the entire thing from the face of the earth so that the plasmodium vivax or the plasmodium falciparum will no longer have a vector to transfer itself into your body so your problem is solved but in solving your problem mosquito is dead the the the, the parasite now does not have a vector and you have invariably affected the entire ecosystem it is good only don't worry malaria is cured the human species is safe that is what matters to us but it will have consequences sooner or later the parasite will find another host will find another vector and that vector will come to the human being and again we must find a method to combat that so this is a cyclic process but i just wanted to show you the consequence of this so we are going to the final slides where you have to think really hard and i am going to try to scare you this is sir francis galton very very dangerous fellow if you read the uh, lines which are written in his time they used to measure the head the length of the nose the bridge of the nose to see whether you are a very good human being or bad human being whether you are having superior uh, intelligence or inferior intelligence just as we try to sequence the genome today to identify different diseases or susceptibility to aggression or susceptibility to have uh, a certain kinds of behavior this guy took it to the extreme you can read the words these are his words which are published in american journal of sociology in 1904 it is not very far away in uh, 30s and in 1940s we had uh, uh, adolf hitler doing genocide by trying to wipe out an entire species so you see we wiping out species yes we have done eugenics on dogs dog breeds cows and other domesticated animals uh very very true is it ethical or it is unethical so that is the question here i will not comment on it in my lecture so it is up to you to start exploring on these aspects answers are there good answers are there but you have to really explore so i i hope my lecture has made you think on these aspects so you see his words are very, very profound what nature does blindly slowly and ruthlessly man may do providently quickly and kindly as it lies within his power so it becomes his duty to work in that direction the improvement of our stock seems to be so you can see the the kind of words that is using very very powerful words and the conviction that they have these people are convinced that their view point is correct and it is truly really dangerous and they this is for human being this is not for any cow donkey monkey this is for human being this particular person felt that one kind of human being is far more superior than the other and it is okay to eradicate that particular population of human beings today's society it is unthinkable but in that society it has been done and it may entirely become possible in tomorrow society also so zobrist zobrist is a villain in uh, dan brown's novels so the inferno novel if you read <laughs> actually it is uh, it is very 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 similar to what is going on right now biowar in the end you will see that a virus has been released across the world and many people are infected and a pandemic has started so nowadays you come to realize that many of these novels and these movies have come to life thank you sir you have read that. so this is the uh, article of the uh, this is the words of the zobrist so this particular thing is on population theory so we have lot of population theories malthus theory we have so zobrist has told this as a justification to eradicate the human species so that is what he, he says and he has people to support him also so but it's a fictional character but the fictional character may become non fictional also perhaps it has already started 
So we are at the last slide of the day uh, before the conclusion slide. So in the movie Apocalypto, I do not know how many of you have watched this Mel Gibson's movie Apocalypto. It is a very good movie. Please watch it when you have time. Uh, so this story is very, very important. And a man sat alone, drenched deep in sadness. All the animals do here. We do not want you to be so sad. So the environment takes pity on the man and each person, basically I'm trying to summarize the story here. You can also read. Uh, so basically what happens is every single animal will give one body part to the human being and they're making stronger and stronger and stronger. Finally, the animals uh, slowly they will realize, oh my God, we have created a being which is much more stronger than all of and perhaps it will decide to survive. If you look at the behavior of the coronavirus, it is doing its to survive by multiplying and making more and more copies of itself. Is this environmentally ethical on the part of the coronavirus? Is it even right to ask the coronavirus to uh, be ethical? So this environmental ethics is something that we are aware of and we human beings are following. In nature also, ethical systems can be seen and can be felt. There is a certain amount of truth in ethical, in environmental systems also. That is why there is a balance. And it is not because of morality. Please understand, be very, very scientific about this. Environmental ethics at the end of the day is not based on morality. It is based on equitable uses of resources, equal allocation and distribution of materials, material balance, nutrient fluxes, the ability to recycle the elements and the survival of the planet itself as an entirely conscious being. So from there, the top of the funnel, you go down and you come to yourself, which I started in the beginning of the presentation and you try to analyze all the things I have discussed like this and please try to become more aware of the issues of environmental ethics. So I think I have covered almost every concept of environmental ethics. Some concepts from many other concepts are remaining. A very good place for you to go through environmental ethics in case you are interested is the Stanford Encyclopedia on Environmental Ethics. So that is considered as the standard. So you can go through that or you can always contact me. I am all, we are working very closely with several people who are uh, good bioethicists and uh, we have a very good bias movement in India as well and in abroad also. So please stay in touch and uh, These are my contact details. Uh, so thank you. Namaste. It is time for questions if it is possible. And uh, please don't forget to give us your feedback. Huh? So that is my email for you. And that is my phone number. It is also my WhatsApp number. So you can also WhatsApp me. So thank you. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was a pleasure and a very good audience. All of you answered all the questions very nicely. Good students. Thank you very much.